According to Dwarven legend, their civilization was founded by seven brothers, who each founded one of the castes that structure their society. One of those brothers was Orzammar, who would dig the mines that would form the foundations of the city that bears his name. His descendants formed the mining caste. In the days of the ancient Dwarven Empire, Orzammar was a center for the mining and smithing castes, while the noble houses governed the empire from the northern city of Kal Sharak. They were both among the twelve great tigs that served as the major hubs of the empire. In 1170 ancient, King Endrin Stonehammer moved the capital from Kal Sharak to Orzammar, in part to better oversee the commercial goings of the empire, and in part to distance the center of dwarven political power from the chaos that had engulfed its greatest trading partner, the Tevinter Imperium, after the death of the first Archon, Durinius. The proposal to move the capital had initially been put forward by Endrin's predecessor, Orsic Garol, but Endrin chose to act on it. The movement of the capital brought with it vast construction projects to Orzammar, including Stonehammer Hall and an expansion of the Proving Arena for the Grand Provings. For the better part of a thousand years, Orzammar remained the center of the Empire, and then it all began to fall apart. Around 395 Ancient, the Dwarves began to hear reports of strange creatures in dark corners of the Deep Roads. Initially, little notice was given, for the Dwarves had been caught in the middle of a brutal inter-house civil war. By 380 Ancient, entire tags had begun to fall as the Empire was assaulted by an apparently endless horde, the Darkspawn. The Dwarven Empire would have collapsed then if not for the actions of a member of the warrior caste named Iduken, who bypassed the squabbling noble caste entirely and took command of the armies. He enlisted the mining caste to collapse overrun tunnels and the smith caste to provide weapons and armor. He was said to have a passion for assuring the safety of Orzammar that bordered on obsession. Idukin was hailed as the savior of the Empire and named a paragon. His efforts could only delay the Darkspawn advance, however. For centuries, they fought a losing battle against these blighted monstrosities. On the surface, the Grey Wardens defeated the Archdemon Dumat at the Battle of the Silent Plains in 203 Ancient. The Blight was declared over. But for the dwarves, that only meant the retreating darkspawn had returned below ground and increased the number of those assaulting their empire. Communications between the great tigs became strained as the dwarven lines were pushed back. Finally, in 40 ancient, Orzammar lost contact with the other remaining great tigs entirely, and to save the capital, King Threestone ordered the sealing of critical passages of the deep roads that connected them to their brethren. And so, Orzammar was alone. For a thousand years, Orzammar has fought tooth and nail to fend off the darkspawn hordes at its gates, losing and regaining ground in the outlying tigs while desperately preserving the traditions of their civilization. The Dwarven civilization is built upon a hereditary caste system. Caste is inherited from one same-sex parent, so a daughter born of a marriage between a smith caste mother and a merchant caste father would be of the smith caste, while a son would be of the merchant caste. According to tradition, the seven castes are the descendants of seven brothers. The youngest and wisest, Bloodlick, was chosen by the rest to be the first king of the dwarves. His children became the noble caste. The noble caste governs the dwarves through the assembly of the clans, in which the most influential noble houses each hold a seat filled by a representative called a desher. To qualify for a vote in the assembly, a house must count a past desher, general, or paragon among its ancestors. A particularly well-respected noble is chosen to be the steward of the assembly, who presides over the proceedings and maintains decorum, though they are not allowed to vote or voice their opinion to sway the votes of others. 
The Assembly passes legislation and advises the ruler of Orzammar. They may also pass judgment in the case of particularly serious crimes, such as kinslaying. If the ruler of Orzammar has died, been deposed, or abdicated, control of the city guard falls to the steward, who must maintain order until the Assembly has chosen the next monarch. Rulership of the dwarves is not a hereditary position. Each monarch is elected by the assembly, though in practice the assembly usually honors the ruler's choice of successor, often their own child. Otherwise, the process of choosing a monarch sometimes proves chaotic, with the blackmail and even killing of deshers occurring. The assembly also has the power to declare any dwarf a paragon. The Paragons are the most revered of Dwarves, named for their great achievements that have aided the Dwarven people. As the Dwarves venerate their ancestors, Paragons are regarded as living ancestors, held up as an ideal whose word holds more weight than a king, though they have no official power. What deeds will elevate a Paragon will vary. The first Paragons proclaimed in Orzammar were warriors, who became champions of the Grand Proving Arena. Military heroes and ingenious inventors too may become paragons, but also storytellers and brewers of ale. Any dwarf that is an exemplar of their trade and provides some great benefit to dwarven society may be raised as a paragon. Regardless of their prior caste, each paragon and their families are elevated as a new noble house, taking the paragon's name. In Orzammar, the noble caste live in the Diamond Quarter, the uppermost level of Orzammar where the lower castes are forbidden to enter without permission. The noble estates share the Diamond Quarter with the Assembly Hall, Royal Palace, and the Shaperit. The Shaperit is one of Orzammar's most important institutions. The Shapers, most of whom are drawn from the noble caste, with rare exceptions for gifted members of other castes, act as historians, scholars, and judges for the dwarves. The principal purpose of the Shapers is to record information in the Wall of Memories, using lyrium runes to store the thoughts of the dwarves creating them. In this way, in addition to an expansive traditional archive, the dwarves record their history, notable events, birth, death, marriage records, and even business dealings. Shapers are often sent out on expeditions to old tigs in search of information lost during the fall of the Dwarven Empire. They also carry out bureaucratic functions, regulating changes to Orzammar's structure and acting as judges for crimes that are not grave enough to be handled by the Assembly. The Shaperit is led by the Shaper of Memories, also called the Lord Shaper. The Lord Shaper will be the one to crown Orzammar's king once they have been chosen by the Assembly, and oversees the city's most crucial records, the memories, stored in Lyrium. The records stored here are considered some of the oldest and most extensive in Thetis, but they are not perfect. The Shaper of Memories records only that which is deemed worthy by the dwarves. Castless dwarves are not recorded in the memories at all, and dwarves declared to be traitors by the assembly are usually stricken from them. It has also been known to happen that noble houses will attempt to influence or bribe shapers to alter or erase records to show their families in a better light, though they are supposed to be above such things. Aside from the shaperate of memories, there is also the shaperate of stone, which handles the more mundane records of daily life, business dealings, marriages, births, and deaths, there is also the Shaperit of Golems, which is now largely defunct, with a dwindling number of Golems controlled by Orzammar over the last thousand years since the disappearance of Paragon Keridin and the Anvil of the Void. Some Shapers also study enchanting runes, the creation of magical effects by folding lyrium into items. After the Noble Caste, the next most prestigious of the castes is the Warrior Caste. The warrior caste claims descent from the eldest of the seven brothers that founded the Dwarven Empire, Kyotchet. He swore to become the protector of his youngest brother, the king, and trained his sons to guard him. And so each warrior caste house is sworn to serve and protect one of the noble houses. 
A noble house may have several warrior caste families sworn to their service. The prestige of a warrior house is attached to the prestige of the noble house they serve, and they may raise the prestige of both houses by competing in the provings. The dwarves hold that victory and ritualized battles, some to the death and some not, held in the grand proving arena, prove that one holds the favor of the ancestors, Valos Atreidum. Provings are often held to settle disputes between noble houses, for the dwarves hold that the possible death of a single dwarf is better than risking violence between noble houses and the warrior caste sworn to them. Provings are also held for memorials, celebrations, for the honor of a particular house or individual, and on particularly prestigious occasions, a grand proving is held. Once a year, a special tournament called the Trials of Blood is held to crown Orzammar's most skilled fighter. It is mostly the warrior caste that fights in provings, but members of other castes occasionally participate. The lot of the warrior caste is arguably one of the bleaker ones in Orzammar, for to them falls the task of holding the line against the constant press of the darkspawn on the city's territory. They are well equipped for this task, however, as the warriors train to fight their entire lives. A few follow the path of the Berserker, a rage-fueled fighting style developed by the dwarves and taught by them to some humans, such as the Ash Warriors of Ferelden. Men and women alike fight in the warrior caste, ever since the paragon Astith the Grey proved her resolve, but the women face an additional pressure to produce many children, so that the numbers of the warrior caste may be replenished from those lost in battle. Persistent exposure to the darkspawn corruption in the deep roads has led to a loss of fertility among the dwarves overall, and so this is a constant looming problem. It is said the brother Orzatyar forged the first swords, and his children became the smith caste. The smiths have always held a place of prestige in Orzammar, as it was a great center of their craft long before it became the capital. They supply the warrior and noble castes with weapons and armor, and produce many goods for sale in Orzammar and beyond. Some smiths are also knowledgeable in the practice of runecrafting, and use it to enchant weapons and armor. The smiths of Orzammar have some of the greatest knowledge of metalworking in Thetis, but not as great as they once were. In particular, they lost a great deal of knowledge when the Taig of Kalharal fell, once a place of learning for the smith caste. The brother Shotkyar founded the artisan caste. They are closely aligned with the smith caste, and often decorate the products they produce, but they are viewed with less respect. The artisans are responsible for producing most goods not produced by the smith caste and works of art. As I said before, it was the brother Orzammar that dug the foundations of the city that bears his name and founded the mining caste. For that reason, the miners have long wielded great influence in the city, as it is their ancestral home. The miners are responsible for most of Orzammar's wealth, and the mining guild has great power to determine how those resources are distributed. They mine the metals used in dwarven metalwork and quarry the stone used in their construction. They extract precious metals and gemstones, but by far the most valuable substance they traffic in is lyrium. The dwarves' resistance to magic allows them to mine lyrium in relative safety, and they closely guard the secrets of its safe storage. Thus the miners allow the dwarves of Orzammar to maintain a monopoly on the export of lyrium. Legend says that the two remaining brothers were twins named Koapar and Nacht. Both founded trading houses, but after Nacht was wounded in battle, he swore that he would serve his brother's sons. And so Kopar's children became the merchant caste, and Nacht's children became the servant caste. Most goods produced in Orzammar, or brought to Orzammar from the surface, pass through the hands of the merchant caste. Due to the physical limitations of the Orzammar commons, only a few merchants are able to own physical shops, while the rest compete for permits for choice spots to open temporary stalls, 
an advantage many are willing to bribe and cheat for. Merchants are only able to sell their wares in the Diamond Quarter with special permission, and usually only on special occasions. The servant caste perform many jobs for the higher castes, from maids, messengers, and washerwomen to cooks and barkeeps. Most take pride in their service and are generally treated with respect by the other castes. They have the knowledge that even a humble servant may become a paragon, as has happened in the past, though usually posthumously. There is an underclass to dwarven society, a large population born outside the caste structure, the casteless. They are believed to be the descendants of criminals and undesirables that have been rejected by the stone, likely being those punished under dwarven law by having their caste stripped and their names stricken from the memories. As such, they have no status and no protection under dwarven law. The castless live at the bottom of Orzammar's tiered structure in a slum called Dust Town. As such, they are sometimes called Dusters, which the city guard makes no effort to patrol. It was once the site of dwarven palaces, but they were abandoned and the castless allowed to squat in the ruins. Each castless child is tattooed with a noticeable brand soon after birth, by law, so that none may pass themselves off as anything else. The castless are banned from doing any work that falls under the duties of one of the castes, as the assembly deems that it would be an insult to the ancestors to have a castless attempt the work of a recognized caste. Many castless resort to crime to survive, and in Orzammar, that means the Carta. The Carta is an ancient castless crime syndicate that operates from Dust Town, but has spread its influence even across the surface of Thedas. In Dust Town, they are the only power, and the residents live in terror of crossing them. Nonetheless, some castless are able to find other ways to sustain themselves. Nug breeding for races has become a lucrative business for some. Others find odd jobs in the commons, like street sweeping and acting as cheap helpers for merchants who are willing to hire them. But castless truly wishing to escape their status have few options. One is to become a paragon, which is a decidedly remote possibility. For castless women and a few men, there is another option. Remember, dwarves inherit their caste status from their same-sex parent. So even if the mother is castless, the son of a noble will still be a noble. Due to the pressures of the Darkspawn threat and the general loss of dwarven fertility, it has become accepted practice for noble caste men to have dalliances with castless women called noble hunters. Usually funded by a patron, these women are trained in elocution, singing, poetry, music, and educated all grooming in the hopes of attracting the attention of the higher castes. Their patrons bribe the noble hunter's way into the diamond quarter, and if they attract the interest of a nobleman and successfully produce a son, they will be accepted into the noble's house as a concubine and allowed to bring their family to live with them in the diamond quarter. The nobleman gains a son and enjoys the company of a beautiful and sophisticated woman, and the woman's family gets to live in comfort and luxury. Both groups view the practice as mutually beneficial, and so it has persisted through the years. Though called noble hunters, they sometimes target members of other castes. Castless men do sometimes seek to elevate their status through relationships with higher caste women, but should such a relationship produce a son, the mother's family will likely pressure her to abandon the child in the deep roads rather than accept a castless child. A third option for a castless wanting another life is to leave Orzammar for the surface and start from scratch where their branded faces mean nothing. Even then, many castless would hesitate before taking that step onto the surface. The dwarves call themselves the Children of the Stone. They venerate but do not worship the stone. She who supports them, shelters them, accepts them into her embrace in death, and offers them all the precious stones and minerals of the earth as her gifts. Dwarves born and raised underground have a stone sense, 
an innate sense of direction underground that allows them to navigate the endless tunnels. They quickly lose this after prolonged time spent above ground. And so there is a deeply ingrained cultural belief among the dwarves of Orzammar that going to the surface strips one of what makes them a true dwarf. Even standing under an open sky is enough for the dwarves to consider one an outcast and strip them of their place in dwarven society. The only exceptions to this rule are generally made for the purpose of fighting Darkspawn. Despite the pride of Orzmar's ruling castes, who pretend otherwise, they are utterly dependent on the surface trade for survival. Even nobles maintain correspondence with supposedly castless merchant relatives on the surface, people who, by Orzmar's laws, do not officially exist, and often turn a blind eye to the rampant black market trading facilitated by the Carta. And so Orzmar has generally tried to maintain good relations with its human allies on the surface. The kings of Ferelden have often been guests of state in the city. The Orlesian Chantry, who uses the substance to give their Templars the ability to negate magic, has worked to maintain a monopoly on the surface lyrium trade in the south, and thus must maintain strong relations. At the same time, the dwarves have had a relationship with local Avar tribes of the Frostbacks near Orzammar's gates since before either of those kingdoms were founded, both to keep the road open for trade and discourage the neighboring kingdoms from trying to seize control of Orzammar's primary surface entrance. They have also maintained their millennia-spanning trade relationship with Tevinter, whose mage rulers have an endless demand for lyrium to augment their spells. The dwarves of Orzammar hold fast to their traditions. Only time will tell how long those traditions will hold in the face of their constant state of crisis, or whether the dwarven lines will one day break and they will be forced to abandon their ancient capital. Well, that took a while to put together. I had considered breaking out the caste system as a separate video, but I decided that since the caste system is exclusive to Orzammar now, it made sense to include it here. Then, when we get more details about how Cal Chirac is structured, I can discuss the differences in a separate video about that. I hope you liked the video, and I will be following this up with a few more dwarf videos.